The mission of Fellowship Baptist Church is to exalt Christ, to equip families, and to embrace our community. We had uh, probably over a year ago now, we came together and we, we started praying together and we said, okay, where, who are we as Fellowship Baptist Church? And that's kind of the, the, the things that we came up with. In the last series, if you've been with us, we spent four weeks in a series that we called The Christian Atheist. And we looked at how we, as God's people, can exalt Christ, not only with the words that are coming out of our mouth, not only with what we are declaring, but also with our actions. Well, now we're going to start and we're going to move from exalting Christ and we're going to move into equipping family. So this new series that we're going to be doing for the next four weeks is entitled Bless This Home. And the goal of this series is to equip our people to win at home. So many times in this world, our culture tells us we have to win at work. We have to win with our friends. We have to win here. and We have to win there. But it almost, if we're not careful, what will happen is we'll just stumble through our relationships that are inside of our house. So with a show, by raising your hands, how many of you would say honestly that you want your homes and your families blessed? If that's you, raise your hand. Do you want your homes and families blessed? Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, I guess you want your uh, families and uh, homes cursed, right? Obviously not. We all, want, we all want the best for our families. We want the best for our homes. And all of us desire, really desire for our marriages to be the absolute best they could possibly be. We say we want our marriages to be blessed. We want the best for our children. We want not only for, to give them the best things, but we want to teach them the best things. And we want the best possible future for our children. And to be honest, we want everyone, the futures of everyone in our house to be blessed. But if we look around, blessed is not a word that we use to describe most of our families. Like, what's the number one in this culture, the number one word that's used to describe a family? I would say it would be dysfunctional, right? Or crazy, or messed up. You know, we all put, we all put signs up in our, in our house, Lord bless this mess. And uh, because, I mean, if we're true, true to ourselves, a lot of times there's, we have to deal with a lot of things within our families. And if we look at our culture and we look at families in our culture, I think what we will see is that we'll see a lot of busy families. We'll even see a lot of distracted families. And if we look hard enough, I think we'll see a lot of hurting families. We'll see families that are preoccupied, and we will see some families that are, by definition, dysfunctional. But every one of us would say, and I think everybody in the church raised their hand, they say, I want my home blessed. I mean, we go, we go to Hobby Lobby and we pay money to put up signs in our house, you know, blesses this house and, and this and that. So I think all of us want our homes and our families to be blessed, but very few of us on a consistent basis are doing things to make sure that that happens. I want you to think about your life real quick and think about this. Think about how hard we try to be successful at work. Or if you're, if you're a teenager or in school, how hard you work at your schoolwork or whatever future you're looking for. Think about how hard we try at play. We are really good at playing, right? Finding things that we enjoy to do, but then when it comes to our homes, what happens is, is we're so, a lot of us are so distracted and we're doing, putting so much effort some, uh, at all these other places. If we're not careful, here's what will happen. We've given everybody else every ounce of us and we come in and we sit down on the couch and we're like, done, done, I'm done for the day. I just don't have anything else left. And, and, and obviously that was not God's design for the family. And I want all of us to know this morning that every one of us are called. 
Every one of us are, are called to a ministry. And our number one ministry, our number one target audience is our families. God will never ask us to go out and to minister to the point that it is detrimental to our own families. He's given us our families for a reason, and that should be our number one audience. Our number one uh, priority is to minister to the people inside our homes. And let me just stop for a second, and let me just go ahead and just throw this out here. It might, it might land, it might not, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. Men, I want to talk to the men real quick in the house. God has given us our families to lead, not just to lead physically. Should we protect our families? Yes. Should we make sure that no one talks ugly to our wives? Yes. Should we protect our children? Yes. But should we be the spiritual leaders of our home? Yes. And if we are not the spiritual leaders in our home, then we need to step back and go, hold on a second. This is not God's design for my family. Now, I picked on men for a second. Let me just go ahead and broaden this thing out and go to parents, mothers, and fathers. Our jobs are important. I'm not even trying to say that they're not. Our jobs are important, but they are not near as important as our children and the, the future of our children, and we need to live our lives accordingly. So what are we going to do in this series? This series is for every person in here. This is a series to, uh, to help parents with young children that are just starting up. And this is also a series for empty nesters, or, or like me, soon to be empty nesters. I think anywhere on the spectrum, this is going to talk to us. It's not for my phone, though. Quit. Make sure that doesn't do that again. Sorry, Lord. So, <laughs> I have no idea where I'm at now. Give me just a second. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so this is for families with young kids, family with older kids. It's even for you teenagers and, and kids in this church that are not yet ready to get to that family age. But what better time to start making plans and start deciding what is going to be important to you when you get to that age. So this series is going to be about living the blessed life, living our best life. And we're going to use Jesus's words to tell us how to accomplish this, not only for ourselves, but for our families. It was, uh, if you will, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. This is the very beginning of what most people believe to be Jesus' most famous sermon ever. Okay, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. In the very beginning of this, in Matthew chapter 5, he starts out with basically, how do you live the blessed life? We call this the Beatitudes, okay? But there are nine, <coughs> excuse me, nine characteristics that Jesus tells us of what it means to be blessed. So if you will start reading with me, Matthew chapter 5, verse 2. And he, being Jesus, opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we have this very unique set of nine characteristics, and I believe those nine characteristics would not show up on anybody's list if we were to sit here and say, tell me what it means to be blessed. But we know that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. So Jesus here is trying to give us a roadmap. 
Don't listen to what the world has to say about being blessed. This is what life is all about. This is how you can be satisfied. This is how you can live a life of, of fulfillment. And these are the things, the characteristics that you need to teach your children so that they also can live the blessed life. Before we go any further, let's stop and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for not only showing us the way to heaven and being our salvation and being our Lord, but taking the time while you were here to show us how we can live life to the fullest, how we can navigate this thing called life inside the walls of our home and that we can live according to your plans and live a life that is complete, a life that is satisfying, and a life that is going to make a difference for generations. Lord, I pray this morning that uh, you would just open our hearts and open our eyes to hear your word, that we could hear your voice, and that we give us the courage this day to make a stand and say who we are and who we belong to and who we trust. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I think if we, if we go back and we look at that list, we don't think of things like being poor in spirit as being something that makes someone blessed. We don't look at people who mourn and say that they are blessed. We don't look at people that are meek or people that are uh, uh, merciful or pure in heart. Those things is not a lot of times when we think of blessed. So right now in your mind, start thinking who, if you're looking around, or what kind of people does our society say are blessed? I think every kid in here would say, well, um, I think the influencers are blessed because they just happened to stumble. Somebody had a camera and they said something funny one time and now look at them. They're famous. They're rich. They don't have to work the rest of their life. Look at that person. A lot of people care what comes out of their mouth or they can put on makeup really good or whatever, but they're, they're famous and people look to them. So I would say influencers are blessed. I think a lot of the boys in the, in the place would say those pro athletes, those guys are blessed. Or oh, that celebrity, that person that's the actor or the singer or whatever, look at them. Look at how fabulous their life looks like. They look like they are so blessed. And then to even bring it down to people that we see on a daily basis, we look at that wealthy business owner in town and say, man, that guy right there is blessed. Or we see that really beautiful girl or that really handsome guy and say, that guy is blessed. We see that family that has the vacation home on the lake and say, man, they are blessed. We see that guy who just, you know, was born into money and kind of stumbled into that easy life. We see someone with an expensive car and we go, man, look at that person over there. They are blessed. We drive by people's homes and we look at their homes and we go, man, they are blessed. I wish that I could be them. And that's who a lot of times we as, as a world and a culture, we call these people blessed. And then in an attempt to emulate what we think of being blessed, we start trying to fill ourselves with things that don't matter. And then we find ourselves empty, unsatisfied, depressed, and we find that, you know what, it's not only affecting us, but our pursuit of, of Finding things that we think is going to make our lives blessed, those empty things, our pursuit of those things are affecting everyone around us and that we can look at our homes and say, you know what? Our homes are not blessed because we are trying to emulate a culture and things that are important in culture that Jesus said, you know what? It's not that important at all. Jesus tells us that if we want to be blessed and we want our lives to be full, there are certain things that we need to do. And I want to hone in this morning on one of those Beatitudes. It's Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. And I really want to break down these words. I really want us to think 
about what Jesus is saying here. In verse 6, he said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You want to see people that are blessed. You want to see families that are truly blessed, that are happy, that are fulfilled, that are making a difference in their community. Blessed are those, not that are rich, not that are famous, that have influence. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then he puts a little, uh, a little promise at the end telling you exactly what happens to these people. Why are these people blessed who hunger and thirst for righteousness? For they shall be satisfied. In a world that constantly makes us want more and more and more. We get this and it only, <coughs> excuse me, it only makes us want to go after that. And we have this continual, I got to have this, I got to have this. Jesus said, blessed are the ones who hunger and thirst after righteousness because they are satisfied. Is that not really the goal of every one of us? When we wake up in the morning, is that not what we're trying to accomplish that day? Are we not trying to find things that satisfies us? Jesus is telling us here, this is what will satisfy you. This is the, it, and this is the only thing that will do it. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So let me stop, let me ask a question. I believe, uh, I believe that we as Christians should always be in a period of self-reflection. That we should always examine ourselves and examine our lives and look and say, hold on a minute, is there anything of the world that's creeping into my life? Is there any thought or is there any belief in my head that culture has taught me that is hindering my life and hindering my spiritual walk? So with that, I want you to be real honest with yourselves because I'm going to give you mine I don't expect you to give me yours, but I do expect you to think about it hard and really have an answer to this question. In your home, in our homes, what do we hunger for? Think about it. In your home, what do you hunger for? I'm going to make it a little bit easier. The last seven days from the time you left here last week to now, in your homes, what have you and your family been hungering for? Have we been hungering and thirsting for righteousness in our homes? Or have we been hungering and thirsting for something else? Again, honesty, guys. If we can't be honest in the house of the Lord... I, I, I get it. I know, I know culture has taught us to put, on our, to put on our nice clothes and we get here to the church and we smile and we act like all of our families got it together when we yelled and screamed at each other all the way up here and we're mad as fire at each other and we walk in the door and we're like, hey, God bless you, everything's great. Let's be honest this morning. The last seven days, what have we been hungering and thirsting for? I can go ahead and tell you, and y'all just keep this between us, but I've been putting in minimum 70 hours a week. It's pushing more to 80 and 90 for going on week 14 now. I am absolutely exhausted. And when I started thinking about this message, I'm going, what am I hungering and thirsting for? Relaxation and comfort. That is the number one on my priority list, and I'm not calling it right. I'm just being honest with you. If I were to ask your children, and I were to ask my children, what has mom and dad been thirsting and hungering after the last seven days, what would they answer? Would it be their hungering and thirsting after that relationship with Jesus and hungering and thirsting for me as a child to also be hungering and thirsting or is it something else we can put things in there I, i'm guessing probably not all of you but i'm guessing if i were to list this out which i'm fixing to a lot of us are going to be in this we hunger and thirst for comfort we hunger and thirst for fun 
just something out of the mundane. Just give me something to do besides my work. I'm hungering and I'm thirsting for something else. Some of us is image. We're hungering and thirsting to portray that image to the world that me and my family's got it going on. And in truth, it's not necessarily the right answer. It could be popularity. It could be I want hunger and thirst for people to accept me and for people around me to put me in that group and allow me to be a part of them. Could be, uh, and, and I mean, this is me a lot of the times too, we could be hungering and thirsting for that win. It might be, in my case, the win on the football field. It might be the win of getting that contract at work or the win of that promotion or whatever it is. Is that what we're hungering and thirsting over? Could be just to be the best. I want to be the best at everything that I'm doing. But the truth is that in our culture, you can, if you really look at it, most of us are prioritizing something over God. Is it any surprise that we are living in the most depressed, most unfulfilled generation of all time? Because culture is constantly telling us, you have to run after this, you have to run after this. If you don't have this, you're not going to be satisfied. If you don't do this, and it's almost like every second of every day, we have to go and go and go and go. And we fill our lives, and we're so full of the things that the world tells us we have to have. We have no room to be hungry or thirsty of anything that has to do with God. So what do we do when we realize that we are hungering <coughs> or thirsting for something other than God? What do we do when we realize that we have an appetite for things that will not satisfy? The only answer is, is we have to do whatever we can in our power to change our appetites. How many of you like pizza? Pizza's it for me, thank you. Pizza's it. Thin crust? Yes. Thick crust? Yes. Dipping sauce? Yes. Okay? I'm, I'm down with it, okay? You can even give me a Supreme pizza. I'm going to take a couple things off of it, but yes. Okay? As long as you don't put, like, uh, anchovies or pineapples. I'm pretty much good. Like, why in the world would you put pineapple on a pizza? I mean, don't ruin the good stuff, right? Arlie. Really? Pineapple pizza? Okay. <laughs> we'll just go with all kind of pizzas good. How about that? There was a study done where they took pizza lovers, okay, people that absolutely just loved pizza. It was their favorite food, and they told them, they said, okay, for 30 days, we're going to do an experiment. We're going to provide you all the food. You can't eat pizza at all. Actually, you're going to have to eat nothing but really healthy food. We're going to give you fish. We're going to give you vegetables. We're going to give you all these things that are really healthy for you. And after 30 days, if you make it to that 30 days, we're going to throw you a pizza party. And we're going to have all you can eat pizza. And we're going to have every kind of pizza out there. Well, these people were denied pizza, denied the thing that they love for 30 days. And then all of a sudden, they came to this pizza party, and they're so excited. Like, oh, my gosh, it's been 30 days. I've been struggling. I need pizza. And they started eating the pizza. And the people that were doing the experiment started recording what was going on. And where people used to be able to sit down and eat piece after, after piece after piece of pizza, they couldn't do it anymore. All of a sudden, they start complaining about how greasy the pizza was and how it hurt their stomach and that they just, just for some reason, the pizza just didn't taste as good as it used to. Well, what happened? They changed their appetites and what they craved for significantly changed over that 30 days. And with that same thought process, in this, if we begin to seek God, if we be begin to pursue God and hunger and thirst for righteousness, when we begin to see all the benefits that come with seeking God, I believe a lot of the junk food of this world, a lot of the things that we've been filling ourselves with, will just not be as appetizing as it used to be. Those things that distracted us, those things that were not good for us, those things that, would, that, that don't satisfy, if we start trying to purposely change our appetite, 
those things of the world will little by little become less and less appealing to us. You say, Robbie, that's easy. You're making it sound like the blessed life is just a decision. Boom, here I go. If it was that easy, why isn't everybody doing it? Why, why are all Christians just jumping right into this? Well, I think there's a couple things that's out there. Is Our world and our culture tells us something is Christianity that is not. Okay, And I'm going to give you two of them here. One of them is a counterfeit version of Christianity. It's called legalistic Christianity. This is where we go, okay, God, I want to be blessed, so I'm going to follow some rules. Give me the rules. Tell me what to do. Tell me what not to do. Make sure you don't drink, don't, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't hang out or date girls that do, right? That's pretty much for the longest time in church. That was the rules. Don't do those things, and you can call yourself righteous. But anybody in here will agree with me that rules without relationship leads to rebellion. <coughs> Christianity was never meant to be a series of rules that we follow. And sometimes whenever we get to that low point and we go, this, the world is not satisfying anymore, we turn to the church and our idea is, okay, fine, I'm going to start following the rules. I do, I do, I do, I don't, I don't, I don't. And we get there and we realize that those rules are not satisfying. And we go, you know what, I'm not doing the things I used to do, and I'm doing all these good things, but you know what, I still am not satisfied. Legalistic Christianity does not work, but on the other end of the spectrum, lukewarm Christianity does not work either. This is what we talked about the last four weeks with that Christian atheist style of worship, where with our lips we are saying we are something, but with our actions we're not. We're not spending time with Jesus. We're not following him. We're just kind of going through the motions and we're just kind of doing this thing. I'm going to try to work till salvation and I'm going to get there and I'm going to stop and I'm not going to go any further. Legalistic Christianity was never what we were supposed to do. Are there rules in Christianity? Yes. Should we follow them? Yes. But when we follow the one that is right, we end up doing right. Amen? And then at the same time, we were never meant to just put one foot into the, uh, in the water. Scripture says deep calls to the deep. Jesus wants us to jump in all the way and says, I want you to follow me. I want you to hunger after me, thirst after me. And what am I going to do? I am going to fill you. Christians have a relationship with Jesus. Christians are following Jesus, period. Christians do not have a relationship with the rules, and they do not have a relationship with religious events. We do not have a relationship with Fellowship Baptist Church. We come here to show and to be a part of a community of people that have a relationship with Jesus. And if all we're doing is having a relationship with this church, but we don't have a relationship with him, it's never going to satisfy. We can call ourselves a Christian. We can call ourselves whatever we want, but if we don't have a relationship, we are not a Christian. We are just a rule follower, or we are someone like a Christian atheist that is saying one thing but doing another. We can call ourselves a duck, and we can quack all day long, but the truth is if we don't lay eggs and we don't fly, all we are is a human walking around quacking, right? Same thing with a Christian. If we do not have a relationship with Jesus, we are just lying to ourselves. Notice, Scripture does not say, Blessed are those who call themselves Christians. It doesn't say blessed are those who believe when it's convenient. It says blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let's make sure we stop and we talk about this. We are incapable. The word righteousness means the ability to be right. We, as human beings, have no way zero way can we be right in front of god almighty except through a relationship with jesus what makes us right with the father 
is believing and having faith in the Son and following the Son and that relationship, allowing Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior. So when it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, it could very well say this, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for a relationship with God's Son. If we want a blessed lifestyle, that has got to be where we focus our efforts is all in that relationship with <coughs> excuse me, with Jesus. King David in Psalm 63, 1 says this. <coughs> Y'all, excuse me. God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. That is almost a blueprint of how we need to have that interaction with God. Notice nowhere in here did he say, I'm following the rules, God. Did he say, hey, look, I'm doing the minimum. He says, everything about me wants to be around you. I have beheld you. I have seen you in the sanctuary. I have seen how good you are. And I have seen who you are. And it makes my lips want to confess. It makes my heart want to follow you. Now, I want to use this verse, and I want to change from the singular to the plural, okay? So y'all give me just a little bit of liberty this morning. Can this, can this scripture be who we are in our families? Tell me as I read this that this does not just as a parent or as someone, tell me that this doesn't just make your heart just be on fire. What if this was your family scripture? God, you are my family's God. You are our God. Earnestly, everyone in my family seeks you. Our souls thirst for you. Our flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So we... Me and my family have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, the lips of my family will praise you. So we will bless you as long as we live. And in your name, my family will lift up their hands. Doesn't that sound amazing? Doesn't that sound like, yes, that is it. That is what I want for me and my family, is I want everybody in my family sold out to this thing called Christianity. I want us all to be pursuing that. But the problem is, we stumble a lot of times through our life at the house because that's when we finally get a chance to relax and we don't make God the focal point. Now also, give me just a little bit of liberty here with this scripture. What if I changed it to this? Popularity, you are my God. I earnestly seek you. Popularity, my soul thirsts for you. Doesn't it just sound dumb? Job promotion, you are my God. I earnestly seek after you. Promotion, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. Oh, championship of the 8U Soccer Champion League. My soul thirsts for you. It doesn't even make sense, does it? You, Instagram reel, and me looking good in front of everybody. You are my God. I am hungering and thirsting after you. You, high score on my video game, you will get all of my time and you will get all of my love and my affection. Uh, you, eighth grade boy that I'm crushing on that I won't like next year, you get every bit of my attention. Doesn't make sense, does it? But for some reason, it doesn't, it doesn't do that to us when we actually do it in life, does it? It's kind of like we just kind of fall into that little thing and then we go, it's not as good as I thought it was. 
we win the AEU championship soccer trophy and now I have to go and do it in basketball season or I have to do this. And, and what we find is, is that we do all these things trying to fill ourselves and satisfy ourselves and none of it does. The only thing that does is God. So what does work? What does work? I think we all know the answer, but we're going we're to stay here for a second. Chasing after Jesus. A lot of y'all have heard this before, but this is, it's a line that I heard, and it just seems like it just resonates in my soul. There was a linebacker who played for the uh, Baltimore Ravens, and he made the comment. He said, men, don't let your alarm clock be the only thing that gets you out of bed in the morning. Get up in the morning ready to chase God. That is the ultimate adventure. That is the ultimate satis satisfaction in life, is getting up and chasing after your Lord and Savior. And guess what? Allow your family to watch you as you chase God. Become that Christ-centered family that we talked about. We need to create an environment where our kids want to have discussions about God. So it's not something they feel like they have to do, but it's something they want to do. And why do they want to do it? They want to do it because they see us doing it. And they see the satisfaction that we get out of it. Let our children see us being fulfilled. They will want what we have. But you know what? Kids will never want a sham. Kids have a great built-in, you know, bullcrap detector. Excuse my language. But kids can sense a phony like that, especially this generation. If we are just being a legalistic Christian following rules, or we are just being a lukewarm Christian just trying to do enough to get by, I bet our kids don't want, want, want what we have. There's going to be one of two things that's going to happen. If we don't hunger and thirst after righteousness, one of two things is going to happen. Either A, our kids are going to look at us and go, I want something that's real. Or they look at us and they go, I don't want any bit of that. No, thank you. Let our kids see us waking up in the morning. And I'm not talking about putting on a show. I'm talking about let them see us live it out. Let us see them, let them see us get up in the morning and pray. Getting up before we normally would get up. Let them see us reading our Bibles. Let us see us, let them see us seeking God. And better yet, let them pray with us. Wake them up in the morning with us and let them pray with us. Let us read the Bible together. Let us seek God together. Seek that relationship. And Jesus said, I will fill you. I will satisfy you. Matthew 5, 6, again, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Do we want to improve our marriages? Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do we want to improve our parenting? Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do we want to improve our finances? Hunger and thirst after righteousness. If we pursue that relationship with him, God says we are blessed and he will fill us. So I want to close this morning with this thought. So how do we make sure that our families hunger and thirst for righteousness. How do we do it? I love, there's a conversation recorded in the Old Testament. Joshua is trying to lead the people into the promised land. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, he says, And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day. Choose this day. Choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Joshua got up in front of the, the whole nation of Israel and said, Today, today, choose who you will serve. Who are we going to put in that place of, Oh God, you are my God. What are we going to do? We need to choose this day who gets to sit on the throne of our life. 
I love what Joshua says right there at the very end. But as for me, my house, we will serve the Lord. So how do we do this? We make a decision that I am going to start changing my appetite. I'm going to try to do everything in me to hunger and thirst for that relationship. And I'm going to pray that God helps me every day to stay committed to that. Make worshiping our God a priority. Make praying to our God a priority. Make blessing our family the, not A, the priority of our day. My job's important, but it's not as important as blessing my family. All of these things, me going out and having fun and relaxation is important, but it's not going to be the priority of my life. Looking back, y'all know my kids are old and, and uh, are older, about to get out of the house, got one out, one fixing to be out, and uh, we've definitely not done everything right, not even trying to act like we are, y'all all know us. Um, I've made bad decisions, my kids have made bad decisions, I'm not, not trying to sit up here and glamorize our, our family, that's not the point. I'm just looking back and seeing this going, okay, what are some things that I can, maybe some wisdom that I can uh, give to families in church. My daughter loved to run. She was daddy's little runner. She loved to run. Well, I kind of outsmarted her. I said, hmm, you like to run, Kennedy? Okay, it's normally, if you run, you kind of have it mapped out. This is the halfway point. I'm going to run to this point, and then we're going to turn around so we can run back, and we end up at the house, right? It's like, ah. We're going to run until she can't run no more. And when she gets through running, we're going to stop, and then we're going to walk back. Why? Because I wanted to have that time to talk to her, and we made it a point that that became our prayer time. And then when we got older, when she got older, she started running track. And if y'all know me, sleep is in my top five, guys. I love sleep. Love it. But for two years, we got up at 5.30 in the morning, and we went to train for track, and I go run with her, because I knew there was a there was going to be a uh, like a warm up time, and there was going to be a cool down time. And in those times, me and her walked up and down. Usually it was cold when we were doing it, so we were inside the halls in the high school, and we walked up and down them halls, and we prayed and prayed and prayed. On Christmas, we made you know what Christian Christmas is supposed to be about Jesus' birth. We're going to have a birthday cake, and we're going to sing Happy Birthday to Jesus every Christmas. Why? Because we want to make sure that the right thing was the right thing. We went out and served meals together on Thanksgiving. We did Bible plans together as a family so that it wouldn't be just, hey, go read your Bible. But no, we're going to read it together. and We're going to try to have conversations about it. And again, my kids, my kids are a lot of things, but I'm, I'm amazed. Okay, my son will call me and go, Hey, Dad, me and, me and my girlfriend were sitting here talking about this scripture. Can you, uh, put me on speakerphone, can you explain to me what this scripture means? Why does he do that? Because that's, that's what we do in our family. We, we made sure that every summer we went to FCA camp. We did things to purposely make God fun so that they could see other kids that were doing We went to these Christian conferences that our youth group go to now. We've been doing that forever. Why? Because I want them to see other kids their age praising and worshiping God so they don't feel like in this world they're the only one that is attempting to live the life that they are trying to live. So what do we do, guys? We just chase him. Are we going to be perfect? No. Are our families going to be perfect? No. Are you going to make mistakes? Yes. Are they going to, your kids still going to make mistakes? Absolutely. But God says, if you hunger and you thirst for righteousness, you hunger and you thirst, you chase after me, and you chase after that relationship, not only will I call you blessed, but I will fill you. So let us choose today who we and our families will serve. Let's make the decision today, even though it might take me out of my recliner for 15, 20 minutes every afternoon when I'm exhausted. Me and my family 
we will serve the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for how comforting it is. That in this crazy thing called life, in all of these situations where we're trying to navigate life, we're trying to figure it out, we're trying to, to, to just navigate through and try to figure out how to make it, make bills, uh, you know, pay bills, and we're trying to make sure that we're this and we're that, that you give us the roadmap to happiness. You say that if we hunger and we thirst for that relationship with you, not only are you going to be our Savior, not only are we going to allow you to be the Lord of our lives, but that the lives we live here on this earth will be blessed and we will be filled. We will be satisfied when the culture around us is empty and everyone is trying to put everything in that little hole to fill it. You say, if we hunger and thirst after you're in a relationship with you, that we will be content, that we will be filled, and we will be satisfied. Father, I pray that today is the day that all of the families in Fellowship Baptist Church, we make the decision, and it might be make the decision again for the hundredth time. As for me and my family, we choose to serve you because we have seen you in the sanctuary, we have beheld you, and we know how good you are. And because of how good you are, we will follow the rules, and our lips will confess how great you are. Thank you, Father. Bless us as we go and as we chase you. Amen. Please stand.